the International Sunday School lesson for Sunday, November 5th, 2023. The title of this lesson and boys commentary, as well as Towson's Press International Sunday School commentary is, What is Required for Salvation? Hey, if you enjoy our lessons, please let us know by liking, commenting, subscribing, and hit the little bell to be notified when we post each week. To find out more about Jordan Christian Center, a virtual ministry aiming to transform lives by equipping, educating, empowering, as well as encouraging the world, please visit us at jordanchristiancenter.com. Hey, I'm Minister Adam, and Sunday School is now in session. Now, before we get to our lesson, let's start with prayer. Heavenly Father, be with us as we go through your word, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for your son who is the way, the truth, and the life, and there's the only way to you, Lord. So, Father, we just thank you for giving us an opportunity to praise your name and learn more about you. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's get into our lesson. Our scripture will be coming from Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 11, and we'll be in a New King James Version of the Bible today. Then our main thought will be coming from Acts chapter 15, verses 8 and 9, which says, And God, which knoweth the heart, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Spirit, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between them, uh, us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, as we do each week, we'll start with a little background. We're now in the 10th lesson in the new unit titled, Jesus Frees, Law and Slaves. This week's lesson comes from the book of Acts. Now, the book of Acts is the fifth book in the New Testament following the four Gospels. The four separate accounts of the life and works of Jesus Christ is the Gospel. Whereas the Gospel ended with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the book of Acts began with a brief reminder of those events, but it continues with the courage of approximately 30, uh, the first 30 years of the church history. Now, in the first chapters of Acts, it refers to the Gospel of Luke as the author's uh, of the book author, hinting that Luke is the author of both books and Acts is the sequel to the book of Luke. Now, the book of Acts is proved in Jesus word in Acts chapter one, verse eight. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, in Acts chapter two, the Christian um, believers receive the Holy Spirit. And in chapter two uh, through chapter seven, it described this rapid growth of the church in Jerusalem. In chapter 8 through 12, we find a Jewish uh, persecution uh, inadvertently spread the gospel throughout Judea and Samaria. And then in the final chapters, chapter 13 through 28, Paul and his companions spread the good news throughout the Roman Empire. Now, leading up to our lesson today is an important church council was held in Jerusalem in um, 50 AD, just before Paul's second missionary journey. Now, the church leader attended this conference included Peter, Paul, James, the brother of Christ, Barnabas, and Titus. Many Gentiles had been baptized after hearing Peter, Paul, and Barnabas preach. Some Jewish members of the church in Jerusalem came concerned about these male converts not being circumcised. So the church leaders convene a council at Jerusalem to consider whether or not Gentile converts to the church should be required to obey the Moses law. And this is where our lesson picks up in Acts chapter 15, verse one, where there is a dispute between the men of Judea, Paul and Barnabas. It reads, a certain man which came down from Jerusalem taught the brethren, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Certain teachers we find came from Jerusalem here from the church of Anak in Syria, and it can uh, proclaim that Gentiles must be circumcised to be saved. Now, interestingly enough, the church there in um, Syria consisted primarily of Gentiles. So Luke actually presents the heartline argument as one that stresses the need for Gentile converts to be circumcised for a time. 
But he soon showed that the circumcisers wanted um, Gentile converts to practice the entire law of Moses. Basically, they were teaching that a person cannot be saved unless they become converts to Judaism, not Christianity, as we would know it, as as Christ being the only way, the truth and the life to our father. The conflict exists because the people in the church had varying cultural backgrounds. On one end, there were the devout Jewish um leaders from Jerusalem who continued to worship at the temple. Their scrupulous observation of the Jewish practices and way of life. All the laws found in the covenant of God that he made with the Israelites at Mount Zion. Circumcision was a crucial point to that. From the time of Abraham's uh, circumcision helped define a person's faith in God and being part of God's people. But note, to believe this would mean that they would have to do something more than accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It meant that it take more than faith to be a part of the body of Christ. Now, as we move down to verses 2 through 4, Paul and Barnabas respond to the teaching of these men of Judea. And it read, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small, small dissension or disagreement with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go to Jerusalem upon, uh, unto the apostles and elders about this question. And being bought on their way by the church, they passed through uh, Phenis and Samaria, declaring conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. So with the controversy over uh, circumcision for the Gentiles, uh, converts raging in the church of Anoch, and no Doubt spreading throughout the other cities, something had to be done. So to dissolve, resolve this dispute, the apostle Paul and Barnabas, along with other believers, were sent to Jerusalem to consult with the apostles and the elders there. They shared about the Gentile, which we know Gentiles are non-Jewish believers, who had come to the faith in Jesus and the miracles of God that had been done through them. So Paul's belief on this matter is important because he we, is well documented in his own writing, specifically in Romans chapter two, verse 28 and 29, which says, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outwardly in the flesh, but he is Jew, which is one inwardly and circumcision of the heart in spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of man, but of God. So this is Paul belief. He's, he's saying very clearly, it's not about circumcision of, of, of the flesh, but it's the circumcision of the heart, meaning to give your heart to Christ, to cut off your, your heartly flesh, the things that are keeping us of this world, to cut that off is what is meant so we can be with Christ. So the only way through to um, the father is through Christ. But the the vocal minority of Jewish Christians that were based there in Jerusalem and Judea, uh, Judea they disagreed with Paul and they insisted that the um, Gentile converts must adhere to certain aspects of Jewish life, such as circumcision. This disagreement had put the unity of the church in danger. And as a result, Anarch had, had requested a major church meeting in about 49 AD, which will include the apostles and elders of Jerusalem to make the official ruling on the matter. Now, to make their case, the uh, Anarch delegate travels to Samaria on their way to Jerusalem, preaching um, to churches along the way. And they explain how the Gentiles are being converted, citing examples of their own experience. 
Paul and his group, they were warmly welcomed by the church in the areas that they had visited. Eventually, they arrived to Jerusalem, where the church leaders, the apostles and elders had given them a warm reception. Luke intended to convey to his readers that the leaders and the church were accepting of Paul's Gentile program and it was received in a positive manner. But what we're finding is the men of Judea, they came back to restate their plight in verse five, which says, but there arose certain men of a sect of Pharisees, which believe saying that it is needful to circumcise them and command them to keep the laws of Moses. So here we find after arriving in Jerusalem, Paul and his delegate had an official meeting with the church leaders. Now, during this meeting, they reported all the things that God had done through them. However, we find that a certain Jewish Christians belonging to the party of Pharisees challenged Paul after that meeting. This was the first time that converts from the sector of Pharisees were mentioned as a, uh, apart from Paul himself, who we know was a Pharisee that had become a Christian. So these Pharisees, they were Christian believers who acknowledged Jesus as the Messiah. They were influ influential members of both the Jewish and Christian communities, and they were experienced teachers. As such, there were leaders among the Judaizers group um, who had called for circumcision. And it was clear that the pro-circumcision lobby within the church held a significant amount of power. The fact that there were enough converted Pharisees to have the majority voice in the church affairs indicated that the Jewish Christian party had a strong case of dictating terms to the pro-Gentile fraction. What we find here is this, the this is the first theological argument in the history of the church. And it was an important one about circumcision and the laws of Moses that needed to be resolved quickly. Paul had strong words for those who added to the faith, uh, works to their faith. He called them the circumcision party in Titus chapter one, verse 10. And those who mutilate the flesh in Philippians chapter two, chapter three, verse two, and wishes them to go all the way and castrate themselves in Galatians chapter five, verse 12. He points out that if anyone chooses to seek salvation through circumcision and the law, then Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was meaningless to them and salvation is impossible because no one could earn God's forgiveness. Let's look at today. Today, we may have our own, so to speak, Christian Pharisees who try to keep traditions that has interfered with the true meaning of salvation. Traditions meaning that you have to dress a certain way and be saved. Tradition meaning you have to do certain things and be saved. Tradition meaning believing that salvation and the decision for Christ at the altar are the same. The reality is we can accept Jesus into our life anywhere in any place or this tradition of baptizing babies. Well, when you think about baptizing and repenting from our sin and becoming a new creatures, how can a baby repent? These are all traditions. So the Pharisees argue that faith in Christ's death on a cross plus two of the requirements are necessary for salvation. However, to add anything um, to the necessity for salvation other than faith in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross is to insert that Jesus did not finish paying for our sins on the cross. And we know that what the final, final word of Jesus, as we look at the seven last saying was it is finished. The Greek word for it is finished is to tell us die. It was complete. Therefore, there's nothing else needed for salvation. Now, in our final verses, verses 6 through 11, it talks about a discussion at the Jerusalem Council. And it reads, And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter arose and said to them, 
Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choices among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth shall hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the heart, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Spirit, even as he did unto us. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the necks of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as there. Now, let's begin this discussion. Let's talk about the Jewish council and its significance. The Jewish council was the first ever church council. So when you think about how churches from all across the country and the world come together with meetings right now, this will be the first one. And it was held in Jerusalem around 48 A.D. Its discussion was very critical as they established what's required for salvation. Faith in Jesus alone, or is it faith combined with the observation of the law of Moses, specifically the inaugural writ of circumcision? So Paul and Barnabas advocated for the first uh, alternative, while certain other unnamed Jewish Christians supported the second. So Peter narrated his recent experience where God accepted uncircumcised Gentiles into the church, indicating that there is no favoritism from God. This acceptance was evident by the fact that they were that they received the gift of the Holy Spirit, similar to Peter and others on the church inauguration day, which we call the day of Pentecost. Now, after much discussion, James, the brother of Jesus and the predominant leader in the um, church of Jerusalem, gave his judgment. And in his judgment, he quoted the Old Testament prophet Amos, saying that God's plan was to always include the Gentiles in his salvation. He suggested that they should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who turned to God. But instead, they should write a letter to the Gentile believers, instructing them to abstain from certain practices uh, associated with idol worshiping, sexual immorality and consuming blood. This council was crucial milestone as it removed any remaining obstacles for the gospel to become universal. It gave the church's endorsement of the evangelistic task of Peter and Barnabas, whose primary mission was to go to the non-Jewish people in Rome and the world. So it was at this council, as we get back to our verses, that Paul and Barnabas gave their report to the leaders before the beginning of the council. And the 12 apostles plus the elders of the church were present. Then after um, Paul and Barnabas went up, we find that Peter is the first one to support salvation and sanctification by grace at the council publicly. See, Peter recalled his experience of unclean animals descending from heaven in a sheet as described in Acts chapter 10 verses 1 through 48. On that occasion, he shared the gospel with Cornelius, a Gentile military officer. Peter's argument was that it was a matter that had been resolved years ago. Peter's other argument was that the Gentiles gen genuinely believed in Christ and that God gave Gentiles the Holy Spirit upon their conversion. Only genuine believers could actually have the Holy Spirit indwelt in them. Therefore, if they have the Holy Spirit, then they have all they need to be identified as children of God. And Peter's second argument was this, that there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile converts because they all had to be converted to believe Christ as the Messiah, the long awaited Messiah that was talked about in the Old Testament. The fact that, that God did not burden the Gentiles with the yoke of the law, which the Jews themselves could not um, keep. 
To claim that something should be added to the justification by faith was to put a qualification on salvation and put that on the Gentiles that God did not require. So Peter concluded his speech by saying that is grace and not works. So when you think about the law of Moses is works, the circumcisions and the other things that's works. So he's saying is by grace, not works that God's that is God's method of salvation. So no one, whether you're Jew, Gentile or Pharisee, can earn salvation through works. His statement became the official verdict of the Jerusalem Council. What we find is this is Peter's last words in the book of Acts. But guess what? Paul was listening, listening, and he carried this message on. Amen. So in conclusion, the passage highlight the conflict surrounding the requirement of circumcisions for Gentile believers through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's what the the Holy Spirit had to be at this council for all of them to agree. So through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem reached a decision that salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And the Gentiles did not have to he adhere to the Jewish customs and traditions. This decision actually brought unity to the early Christian community and proved the way for the inclusion of Gentiles into the growing movement of Christianity, including us today. See, to add anything to the gospel other than faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ is to put God to the test. If a person challenged the gospel of grace, then they put God to the test. In essence, they question God's method of salvation. And when we add a performance condition to salvation, we test God. But we know that Jesus said he is the way, the truth and the life that no man shall come to the father except through him. Therefore, we are saved by faith. In Jesus Christ through the grace of God, meaning that we can't earn it, but it's freely given to those who believe. Amen. Brothers and sisters, next week, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord, Lord turn towards you and give you peace. I'm Minister Adam and you have a blessed week.